Hey everyone, uh, welcome to another episode of Darshan Talks. I'm your host, Darshan Kulkarni. If you are interested in, in intellectual property, this is going to be a really good conversation because I'm hoping to talk a little bit about patent applications, maybe talk a little bit about trademark applications, maybe even get into transfer of know-how. And I find that to be kind of interesting because there is um, some, shall we say, lack of clarity of what know-how even is. So how do you transfer something that you can't define? Um, so, so I think that's going to be kind of interesting. Um, so if you are starting your own medical, uh, your, your own sort of pharma company, medical device company, tech company, you probably care about this discussion, especially if you're in like health tech. Um, our guest today is, well, we're really lucky to have him. Um, he is the co-chair of intellectual property of the intellectual property group at Stevens and Lee. Uh, you can find him, uh, via his email at john.malgin at stevenslee.com. And I'm going to uh, put that across the screen right here. Um, or you can actually find them uh, via phone at 609-718-0979. That's 609-718-0979. I do want to emphasize that uh, both John and I are attorneys, but neither of us are giving you any legal advice. I'm a pharmacist, I'm not giving you pharma uh, pharmacy advice or clinical advice. Um, I, I advise companies with FDA regulated products. I work with John all the time. He's amazing. He's awesome. Um, these are considerations. They don't necessarily reflect the opinions of the host, the guests, our employers, or our clients. Um, if you like what you hear, please like, leave a comment, please subscribe, please share. Uh, please jump and ask uh, John questions. You can always find me on Twitter at Darshan Talks. Just go to my website at darshantalks.com. Um, and, and this is going to be a really fun conversation. So um, ladies and gentlemen, John Malgin. Hey, John, how are you? Hey, good, Darshan. How are you? Good. Thank you for coming on. I know this was a little bit of a hike for you because I know you were in the middle of um, so many other things. So I appreciate you taking the time. Not not at all. And thank you for that nice introduction. I appreciate it. <laughs> not a problem. So, so, John, talk to me a little bit. You, it's It seems like law firms are super busy right now, working a lot with pharma, with health, with tech. Have you been pulled into those matters recently? I, I have. Um, all of the above. Uh, it's It's amazing how um, recession-proof what we do for a business is. Um, intellectual property seems to rear its wonderful head all the time, no matter what's going on in the economy. Um, so for instance, when things are not going well, they say more litigations occur. And when things are going well, more uh, counseling and prosecution uh, occurs. I'm seeing it all the time in both areas. Um, we we are seeing a lot of litigations popping up, but that's the area I do not deal with. My shareholder, Mark Anania, deals with IP litigation. What I do is the more of the counseling and what we call intellectual property drafting and prosecution of patents and trademarks, um, as well as agreements, which you alluded to earlier in the, in the introduction. So, so you talk a little bit about these, these applications. Let's start with the beginning. Let's start with what I think in the intellectual property world, people think um, are easier things to do, which is trademark applications. And one of the most common things I've seen in the trademark application world is the fact that everyone and his or her brother thinks that they can do them because it seems so simple. Like what could go wrong? What have you seen go wrong when you're actually looking at these trademark applications? Is this something a uh, person can do on their own or, or do they tend to make mistakes and how does that tend to shoot them in their foot if, if they do? do? That, that's a great question. And the, the answer is, yes, there's vehicles at the United States Patent and Trademark Office for lay people or pro se people to file their own trademark applications and patent applications, believe it or not, which we'll get to, I'm, I'm sure, later in the discussion. But let's stick with trademarks, as you asked. Um, you can certainly file your own trademark application, and they, they seem to be very simple to do. The catch is determining what is a good trademark uh, trademark to begin with um, or service mark. Trademark being covering goods, service mark covering services. Both of them collectively we refer to them as, as trademarks, as a superset. Let's, let's talk about that. You can go on, on any of these sites, do it yourself, or you can use LegalZoom, what have you. What you don't get if you don't talk to a trademark attorney is the advice of picking a mark that would be valuable ultimately to you and your company. What I mean by that, there's a hierarchy of, of strengths of trademarks. 
And the hierarchy is as follows. Fanciful and arbitrary at the top, like Apple for computers or Exxon or, or Kodak, which really are coin terms. That's the highest and strongest mark you can have. The next one down is suggestive on the hierarchy, like Mr. Clean for, for cleaning supplies. And then you have descriptive, merely descriptive and generic. Descriptive marks would be like shake and bake for, if you remember the old shake and bake bags that you put your chicken in and you cook it. So generic mark to never get trademark protection. Descriptive marks can at some instances, but merely descriptive marks cannot. Descriptive marks can get protection if you got what's called secondary meaning or acquired distinctiveness, meaning that the word itself is descriptive, but it's come to be known by customers as having another meaning. Therefore, it identifies the source of the goods or services at some point in the future, usually about three to five years out. So when a person goes and files their own trademark application, they may not be aware of that hierarchy of strengths. So they may file on a very descriptive mark and they're going to get a rejection from the trademark office and they don't know what to do with it. So the best advice is to have them talk to a trademark attorney like myself or anyone else and ask, should we even bother applying for this trademark registration for the federal federal registration for this mark. The other thing is that we provide is doing a, a trademark search. We search for marks in the U.S. databases, U.S. Uh, state databases, Canadian databases, anywhere else in the world that you'd like us to search to see whether, mar whether or not your mark is clear for adoption use in federal registration. Because if it's not, you're going to file a trademark application for a federal registration and get it rejected by the trademark office because someone else already has it. it it's funny you talk about that. So I have so many questions that come out of that. And one of my favorite examples that I see is um, I, I live in Philadelphia and I um, we, we all know a descriptive mark. Um, a, fa a famous one is Best Buy. It's the, it's yep. the electronic store. And every time I drive down Broad Street, there's this um, the shop that's it's an auto body workshop and they have exactly the same logo except it's blue but it's called best buy and every time i, I drive past it i always go are they going to survive if best buy really challenges them and the truth is best buy is not policing a local auto body store however my thought would be that th that is such a difficult road to hoe uh, obviously the fact is in this case they're in a completely different business they're not in the electronics world. However, why go down that path? If you're in the world of dis discovering who you are, creating a new mark, is that even the, the path to follow? So my first question to you is, do you find yourself having the unenviable job of telling people, change the name? Yes, all the time. It's, a hard, it's a hard discussion, but a good discussion, because in the end, I'm saving my client a lot of money. Uh, because if they want to go down that route, despite our advice, it's going to be a long road uh, and a lot of issues. Um, and so oftentimes they come up with a mark, which is great. We find some knockouts or some close calls and we suggest, you know what, while you're at the beginning stages and you haven't invested a lot of money, why don't you just try another mark that might be totally off, you know, this one. Um, come up with something that is, again, arbitrary, fanciful, not descriptive. Here's the irony. Most branding people want to have a mark that has intelligence built in. It explains what the product is, right? Yeah. So my explanation to my clients is, yes, you want a mark that explains what the product is. But if you pick a mark that's arbitrary and fanciful and you spend some marketing and advertising dollars, eventually that becomes an even stronger mark than the one that explained the product to me. And so, yeah, I have those conversations all the time. Unfortunately. <laughs> In fact, I'm having a conversation with someone else from Stephen and Lee on exactly this issue where we have to advise someone on a similar issue that's in litigation uh, on this exact trademark issue. So the point is, it is so much better to avoid this problem yes. than to deal with it after the fact. Um, pay me now or pay me later. <laughs> exactly. Pay me now. Pay me a little now or a lot later is the big right. difference. Right, right. Uh, the, the other thing that, that sort of pops up for me is um, I come at this from the FDA perspective and there are, the FDA actually has guidances, for example, on how to name things. And people really enjoy the fact that um, drugs have such complicated names and that they are 
um, often so unintuitive. Um, and I have to explain to them that um, you, you have to think not just about the trademark issue, which is can you actually go to the USPTO, go to the Patent and Trademark Office and, and basically file your mark. But then is the FDA going to be okay with that mark? Yeah. And on top of that, are they going to tie in with what's called the ISMP, which is the Institute of Safe, Safe Medication Practices, and tie that all in together? I remember in like the early 2000s, there was a company that literally would sell names for a million dollars. I, I expect it's a lot more now. But I, I guess my question is, have you come across these companies who basic, basically create a whole brand identity and then just sell these? over and over and over again to different companies? Because I've heard of this, but I didn't know if it was a real thing still. I have dealt with companies that had medical products or pharmaceutical products that had to deal with the dual effect of, is it safe from a trademark standpoint and is it going to get past FDA approval? But I do not have experience with companies that purvey marks that they believe would be approved by FDA, but it sounds like a great business. It kind of is. It's one of those things. I, I've seen that done again in the, I decided it might even be a law school exam. I can't remember which one it was, but I think that was like um, Blue Decks or something like that. And, and all they did was come up with names for decking and right. you could sell that. But it, to me, it's, it's a very interesting area. Uh, but now we, we spoke a little bit about trademarks and I always, when I'm talking to my clients and I'm sort of being, uh, helping them with these initial questions before I call in someone like you. Um, I always talk about the Victoria's Secret versus Victor's Little Secret case uh, from the Supreme Court. Um, could you talk a little bit about what that case stood for, why that's important in this context in terms of why two marks should not be too close and why someone should care if someone else is like, why you should police your marks? Sure. Yeah. So like you said, Darshan, you, every trademark owner has an affirmative obligation to police their marks in commerce. What does that mean? That means that it, you have to keep an eye out and be vigilant of others possibly using a mark that's similar, substantially similar or, or close enough to cause, cause what we call likelihood of confusion. I'll get to that in a second. Um, if it does cause likelihood of confusion, you have an obligation to stop that third party from using the mark. And the reason for that is you're confusing the consumer. And if once you confuse the consumer, you're now, uh, you're now diluting your own mark because now the purpose of a trademark is to identify the source of the goods or services. And if two different sources are using a same or similar mark, such as to cause confusion in the marketplace, you're defeating the purpose of the trademark. So um, in that case, that's what happened. Um, the marks were very similar. They're similar enough and the goods and services goods were similar enough at, so as to cause confusion such that Victoria's Secret had issue with it and, and brought a lawsuit uh, against the other party. Um, this happens all the time. I was involved in a case when I was working at another law firm and it's public so I can talk about this, Bed Bath & Beyond versus Bed & Bath. Bed and Bath is out of California. Bed Bath and Beyond is okay. was based in is based in New Jersey. However, I mean, beyond. what's that? Bed Bath and Beyond. Yeah. yeah, they both have registered marks, but at one point in the early years, Bed and Bath came after Bed Bath and Beyond and said, "You can't do this. We're Bed and Bath. You're Bed Bath and Beyond. There's going to be like a confusion. You have to stop." So we represented Bed Bath and Beyond, being a firm in New Jersey, and we made an agreement that we would never use bed and bath prominently. We'd always have to use bed, bath and beyond. And if you remember years ago, they had beyond was the larger portion of the mark. That was the reason. Well, uh -huh. on occasion, somebody would label one of the products with bed, bath and beyond and all in the same font and size and color and bed and bath would come after us. So we're constantly in court with them. So that is what happens. That's why you going back to your original question, you never want to get close. Get away, get a far away from a larger company that may have a mark that's been out there for a while. Because in, in trademarks, it's he or she who comes first wins. So the senior user is the one who has the rights usually. Now, let, let's break it down to common law rights versus trademark federal rights. Common law rights are very strong trademark rights, but they only limit you to where you are selling the product in commerce. So if you're selling it in you know, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, that's where you have rights. 
That's a common law right, but it's just as strong. However, if you get a federal trademark registration, and the requirement for that is that it has to be interstate commerce that has to be affected, meaning you're selling across state borders, you can get rights throughout the entire United States if you're selling in only two states. So that gives you rights if you're selling in New Jersey and New York, gives you rights in California and everywhere else in between. So that's the value of getting a, a federal registration, not to mention the R in the circle versus a TM for the notation. Um, but going back to uh, your, your, your question is, you know, stay away. And, and here's why. The, the, there's a test for likelihood of confusion, and it includes several factors. Depending on what circuit you're in, it could be 10 upwards to 13 factors. The, the main factors are, and this is what I want most clients and folks listening to understand, it's not about an exact mark. It actually has to do with whether or not the marks are similar. And they could be similar in sight, sound, and meaning, and connotation. So that's the first question. The next is, what are the goods and services? Are they similar, right? And then they have other factors like channels of trade, sophistication of the consumers. Actual confusion is one of the factors, which means there was literally people reaching out to one entity versus the other, and they made a mistake. Um, there's all sorts of factors that come into play. The, the ones I mentioned are the main ones. None of, them, none of them are dispositive, but they're more important. And so that's the analysis we make whenever a client brings us trademark application. I mean, a trademark to file an application on. We go through that analysis for them early on so that we try to anticipate what's going to happen at the patent and trademark office, whether or not they're going to get a rejection under a likelihood of confusion argument. So I, I guess my question is what happens if, so I, I deal a lot with um, in the healthcare world with say pharmacists and pharmacists will often be starting a company in their own name. But if, if it's your own name, chances are there's more than one John Smith out there who wants to open up their own pharmacy doing these things. Are there any special rules that go along with being with, with having your own name associated with your mark? And can you can you prevent someone else from having their own name, which is similar to yours? That's a very good question. There's actually a statute in the Trademark Act that says primarily a surname. Um, I don't know the actual code, but we could find it. Um, but it basically says if if the name you're going for is primarily considered a surname by the consumer, then you can't get a registration on it. If, on the other hand, it's not a name that people would recognize as a primarily a surname, you 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 can go for a trademark registration. Then the second question is, if you've been using it for so long, this goes back to what I mentioned before, secondary consideration or acquired distinctiveness. If it's been used for so long and it still may be considered a surname primarily, can you get a registration? The answer is usually yes. Gallo Wines is an example of that. Coppola Wines, right? Uh, Coppola is a, is, a, is a surname. Gallo is a surname. But because they were using it for so long, I don't know why I got on Wines. I, I enjoy wine. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Gallo I, was I, was Vinian, I was thinking Callow, not Gallo, but that yeah, was yeah, 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 exactly. So, so you know, those are exceptions to the rule. But to your yeah. point, you're exactly right. If someone has a surname, can't use it unless there's some other meaning for it other than a surname primarily, or it's acquired secondary considerations, secondary meaning, or, or, or acquired distinctiveness, and that. Um, there, there is a rule, it's called a it's 2F filing, which says that if you've been doing that for five years or more, there's a presumption of secondary meaning. Prior to that, you can still argue it, but if you file an application under a 2F, you know, you can make an argument that it's acquired distinctiveness presumptively. And, and does that mean that if, some, if I'm John Smith Pharmacy, and um, I'm operating, and turns out there's another John Smith Pharmacy who's operating simultaneously, um, or and, and may have even come before me. Um, in five years, if I'm the one who's filed a trademark application, in five years I can do the two F application and and would have acquired secondary meaning, and now I can sort of preclude the other one. How does that? That's, that's that? a tricky question. That's okay. a tricky question. Um, the 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 answer is kind of sort of or it depends right you know, the famous lawyer answer it depends so if you're aware of john smith pharmacy yeah. uh, or let's take a, a a real example around here where i live in oceanport new jersey um family pharmacy there are 
four family pharmacies, three of which are connected and the other one's not. So, right. you know, how did they come about that name? Now, it's not a surname, but it's similar in, 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 in analysis. The answer is that if you're aware of another John Smith, you, you really can't apply for a federal registration because you know of somebody else out there. Now, if you became if you were senior to that person, you can do that. And then you have to go after them and stop them from using their name because you were senior to them and you were out there more than five years. So therefore, you have acquired distinctiveness and you can stop them. There's another example called the what I call the Dawn Donuts rule, which is if you enter, end up getting a trademark registration and you find out someone else is out there doing it, but you didn't know about them beforehand, they might be able to carve out their little geographical area where they were working if they were senior to you and you weren't aware of them. And they get to ex coexist with you. Uh, so it, it, it was in a case called Don Donuts where they got a registration for Don Donuts. They happened to see somebody, I think, in New York or Massachusetts. Um, they couldn't stop them. Uh, another example of that is called the Wiener King. Uh, and a fellow colleague of mine actually litigated that case. Uh, it was a, it was a part-time uh, owner, you know, owner in Point Pleasant, New Jersey, a shore town. He would only run the 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 you know the shop in the summer. It's called Wiener King. But somebody else in outside of New Jersey had Wiener King. They came and saw him, tried to stop him. He had senior rights within Point Pleasant, New Jersey, in the area, and he was able to keep his name. And they had to carve out an area for him. Very very interesting. So so we've talked a little bit about trademarking. We've talked a little bit about how people how it can get complicated and how people miss the nuances, if you will. Yes. Sir. Um, before before we continue, uh, one quick question. How does this play out in the context of um, service marks? Is it basically the same whether you use trademarks or service marks? What does that R mean? What does the T mean? Or what does pending mean? Like What, what do those terms actually mean? That, that's good. I'm glad we can clarify that. So when you start using a mark in commerce in the United States, you can put a TM if it's a good or a product. You can put a TM next to your mark immediately. And that's called a common law trademark that you're trying to notify the public that you consider it a trademark. You can do it immediately. Same, similarly, if you're providing a service. So a service is not a product, but you're offering any type of service, legal services, uh, software as a service, uh, you name it, uh, uh, you know, insurance services, whatever. You can put an SM standing for service mark. Again, as soon as you start using it in commerce. Uh, and what I mean by that is using the mark and the general public can see it. As soon as you file for and receive a federal registration, you can change that to an R in the circle, which stands for registered trademark or registered service mark. There's no distinction. When you get a service mark or, or a registered service mark or registered trademark, it's still an R in the circle, meaning registered. Um, and so the in between that, when you're pen when it's pending, your application is pending, you still have to keep the TM and SM. Now, in contrast to Copyrights, copyrights, because copyrights are effective as soon as you fix something in a tangible medium, you could put a C in the circle immediately on your copyrighted work. Right. So, so let me let me put it to you this way: as as uh, the average person out there, I can tell you, I've heard the term trademark. Uh, the average service mark is not something I'm familiar with. Right. If that's true, um, can I just use the word TM? Does that matter at all? Like, yeah. can I do with that? So it's not a big deal. I don't lose You're right. Exactly right. I mentioned before, it's a superset. You can say TM covering a trademark or a service mark. It doesn't matter. You're, you're, what you're doing is you're providing to the consumer that you consider that mark to be not just a word or a noun. You're considering it to be a trademark or service mark. And TM covers both. Very cool. So so what I do also want to emphasize, uh, and possibly we may have to keep the other topics for another day because there's just so much we can cover here itself. But um, I do also want to emphasize something you mentioned earlier, which is um, state registration versus federal registration. And that co that's coming up more and more in the CBD world, where people are dealing with this idea of we're trying to, the different states have um, D, what's the, what's the word I'm uh, looking for? Um, it, it's not legalized, but, but they um, are not prosecuting um, in, the case, in the context of uh, cannabis. Uh, and I'm blanking on the word for some reason. But and, and anyway, so the idea being, um, but if you go to the trade, Patent and Trademark Office, they're really not allowing those marks to go through. On the other hand, the state level, there are some registrations. Could you talk a little bit about what that, what's going on there? 
are there any strategies uh, when when state marks matter more than than federal marks, and how if there's a transition process that you can use? Yeah, sure. Um, up until about a year or two ago, you could not apply for mm. a federal registration for a mark that covered a good or service that was illegal federally. So to your point, but believe it or not, they passed the farm, they modified the farm act. The farm and, yeah. and as soon as they did that, you can now apply for a trademark covering cannabis for federal registration because of the, because of the modification or the amendment to the farm act. I had a client right in the middle of that. They were from California. They were doing CBD oil. They asked me if they could apply. I said, no, six months later, they could. I reached out to them. They said, don't worry about it. We applied in California. We're good. So to your point, those who are in this business can apply for state marks if the state allows for these things um, and, you know, get the protection, at least from the state standpoint, and then rely upon your common law rights to, to bridge the rest of the protection across state borders. Um, but now, again, because of the Farm Act, you can apply for a federal registration, so we don't have that issue anymore. It doesn't hurt to get a, a state registration, but to me, unless you're only staying within the state, your best bet is to get a federal registration so you get rights throughout the entire country, especially now that you're selling, everyone's selling on the internet. Um, you know, by most case law, that's considered interstate commerce. If you're able to buy something uh, on an internet, you know, there's a, there's a product and a price and you can actually purchase it. That is considered interstate commerce for purposes of trademark application. So uh, I would go ahead and go for the federal registration. But if you are only limited to your state, get your state registration in order. In what scenario outside the very unique CBD situation, have you seen there be tremendous value to state marks? No, I have not. I have not. Okay. I look at my clients as trying to sell outside of New Jersey or wherever we're located. Um, and so therefore, I don't file many state related marks, to be honest with you. Okay. And, and what if I was, say, an international mark that's trying to come with, into the U.S.? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the most famous one, and we've actually had uh, some guests talk about this as well, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about it. More, the more famous ones are like when, when Burger King went to Australia. Uh, I think it's called Burger Jacks or something like that in Australia. But mm -hmm. um, there are similar marks that are trying to come to the U.S. And um, is, there a, um, is there any control? That, do these companies have any control over uh, their mark in a different country? as they're coming into the US, what should they do? How do they prepare for it? That, that's a good question. Now I'm, I'm, I'm licensed in New Jersey and the United States and we're not giving legal advice out here, but okay. I know a little bit about foreign rights just because I deal with international applications through my agents and associates. Um, and so the, 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 the famous story I heard is McDonald's tried to get into African countries and they already uh, you know, got the registrations. So let me, let me go the other way first. Outside the United States, most countries are registration countries, which means all you have to do is register the mark. You don't have to show use. And so when people were savvy in these other international countries, realize, hey, someday McDonald's is going to come in here. Let's go get the registration. And when they come in, we hold them hostage. And that's what they did. Now, Burger King, probably same situation happened in Australia where they had to go after somebody similar mark. Um, they had to, you know, they had to clear it, so to speak, or get rid of it. Um, when it comes to the United States, we actually have regulations that allows for uh, comedy or respect or priority to marks that were filed somewhere else outside the United States. For instance, let's take Canada. If Canada files a mark, a trademark application, and they want to file in the United States, they file under what's called a 44D. And as long as it got allowed in Canada, the United States will allow it in the United States if there's no, if there's no likelihood of confusion. And it's kind of a smooth transition. So they're, they're giving some respect and deference to these other filings outside the United States. But they still have to file and get it allowed in the United States for, to have protection here. Both, both trademarks and patents are territorial. They're only as good as the registration or issuance of a patent in those territories, in the United States or outside the United States. So if somebody wants to file in the United States and, and have an international presence, they have to file in all those countries and regions where they want protection. 
I think a really important example of that was several years ago, but Michael Jordan had to fight for his likeness in China, I believe. And I think he he kept fighting it because it was really important to him. And they were using the um, his, his mark all over the country. But um, I think that's a really good example of trying to protect it. But with all these countries out there, if you are a truly global mark, it's kind of hard to do that at a, at a, at a whether it's a financial level or even a, I didn't even think of it. Uh, I just didn't realize I'd become this huge brand. And, and what does that actually mean? So that's exactly uh, right. It's, it's exponentially more expensive to go outside of the United States with, with trademarks. So, so what about coming the other way? How do you, do you, do you tend to advise individuals coming into the U S about this type of scenario, or they have have they already typically prepped for it in the countries that they're already in? It's half and half. They've sometimes, you know, if they've come by way of another associate outside the United States, another law firm, an IP law firm, they've prepped for it. But often, yeah. you know, sometimes they'll ask us to do a search. Most of the times they say, hey, we, we filed in this country. We need you to file in the United States, see what happens. And they don't ask us to do a search. And that's fine. And, and when it gets to the trademark office, uh, and a trademark examining attorney examines it and finds another mark, you know, they may reject it. But then again, right. you can use the priority date going back to when they filed in the international country or region to predate something that might have come after in the United States. So right. it's it's a good angle to have. Um, and a lot of times if it's a large enough organization, they got it locked up, they got it covered already, and they're just nationalizing in all the different areas they want to be in. But you're right. It's it's daunting. It's a daunting task. A lot of trademarks. We picked up a portfolio from a client that bought it from J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson. They had marks in every possible country you can think of, countries I didn't even know about. <laughs> and, uh, so one of the jobs that I have is to pare it down to, to a reasonable amount because those registrations and applications can – can have a carrying cost. You so, know, every, so how do you pare it down? Do you base it on sales or what, what do you use to pare it down? That's exactly right. We ask them, are you competitive in those countries or regions? No, yes. Do you have sales there? Do you have production there? Do you care if anyone copies your mark in those countries? You know, and then they ask, answer those series of questions. And then if, if there's really no presence and they don't care, then the last question we ask is, are you willing to defend it over there or assert it over there? Because it's costly. Um, and then we look at the the laws of the of the various countries and, and, and regions, whether or not they'll respect the trademark to foreigners. And if they don't, they may not be worth pursuing or keeping it there because you're you're going to end up losing anyway in a court of law. So that's how we make our 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 decisions on where to cut. So so that's an interesting piece to get into, which is where to cut. Like when I, um, we we've been talking about pharma, and that makes the most sense for my audience, but. A really good example of this would be when names are chosen, names, let me rephrase this. The most famous example of bad naming that I remember is the Ford Nova, uh, which is that don't go, does not move. No um, go. No go. There you go. Thank you. So um, the, the question I have is in that situation, should Ford register in those countries to prevent others from using a market they're using in another country? Or should they not register because they can't actually demonstrate practice in those countries? And how does that usually play itself out? Yeah. So, again, I don't know all the laws of each countries, but it's best to go if you have the wherewithal and the, you know, the, the budget to file your mark everywhere you're, you're going to have a, um, sales. Um, and, then, and then, you know, back off from it later if you're not going to have sales or you don't want to assert your rights over there. Uh, because... In those countries, it's first it's first to file kind of it's it's a, it's a certification or a registration country or region versus actual use. So in Canada, you can register you can you can apply for a mark and 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 get it registered, and then you only have to start using it within five years of of getting it registered. In the United States, you cannot get a federal registration until you've used it. You can file an intent to use application, but once you get the allowance or the allowability, you have to improve it prove you've used it in interstate commerce to actually get the federal registration. Other countries do not ask for that requirement. So hence the, the Burger King and the McDonald's issues, they were registered marks in those countries and they hadn't used them yet. So I would suggest to your point about Nova, 
investigate what these words mean in other countries before you go ahead and waste, you know, spend the money on, on registering it. But if it's if it's legit and it's going to give value and goodwill to your product or services, get it registered early as possible and then determine if you really need it. I mean, but but what is the risk if I was Ford? What is the risk of Chrysler or even a local brand going in and trying to create Chrysler Nova? I mean, if you want it, go take it because the fact is it's a terrible name in that country. Right. So you almost want them to take that mark. Yes. But... In that instance, yes, you want them to take it because <laughs> they're not going to make any sales <laughs> in Latin America. Exactly. So, so I didn't know if there's a strategy for managing something where you're, you're exerting almost defensive rights, where you're going, please take this mark away from me. I need this diluted. But it's, yes. I've never seen that before. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that was one of the famous examples, like you said, and I'm trying to think, I think Esso was, had a similar issue, so they changed the name to Exxon, and I remember that, that speaking, when you said they charged a million dollars, I remember someone uh, from New York City coming up with Exxon to come up with a new name for Esso um, years ago, and I think he charged $50,000, which was huge back then. Um, and I said, wow, I'm in the wrong business, right? But um, <laughs> I do want to point, if I may, uh, point out what's going on in China. Um, if, if I just want to warn folks that if they have devices being manufactured in China, uh, I, I know you have a lot of pharmaceutical companies on the line here, but um, if, if they have manufacturing medical devices or any other type of products and the manufacturer is in China, Get your registration on your trademarks for two reasons. One, if you don't have the registration and someone else gets it, you may not be able to export your products because the border patrol in China will say that you're infringing someone else's registration, even though it's yours. So if somebody else goes and say you have XYZ to cover your goods and you give it to your manufacturer, the manufacturer will go and get the mark XYZ on your behalf to protect you, quote unquote. And that everything's fine and good, but then you decide to use another manufacturer for whatever reason. Guess what? You're going to have to go to your old manufacturer and, and somehow buy that trademark from them because if you have another manufacturer make the product with your trademark, legitimate trademark on it, XYZ, and you export it, the first manufacturer will say, oh, that's an infringement. So that's a little catch that's going on over in China. You got to be careful about it. So in that case, would you make sure that your licensing agreement includes the fact that if you actually file a mark, that IP belongs to me, as long as it's related to everything Abs else? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I'd go as far as to say, get your own trademark going before you even give it to a manufacturer or while you're, you know, having a manufacturer build something, go and obtain one. You know, we work with, again, associates over in China to get trademark applications filed and registered before the manufacturer does it before us. You know? So, so which, which takes me to, and I, I, we're already past time, and I, I'm sorry, but this is just so, so interesting to me. Um, in the patent world, there is a way to really give out your patent. A really famous example of that was the insulin situation where the inventor basically said, I've discovered this for the world. I'm going to give it away for, I think it was like a dollar at that point. But yeah. um, they gave, gave, gave away that technology, and we're not even getting into the pricing issues and all that good stuff associated with it. But that's what happened there. Is there the equivalent of that where you go, I want to give a trademark away? Is that even possible? I don't think so. I think you can. I don't think you can do that because again, it's the, the whole point behind trademarks is to protect the consumer. It's a it's a, a shortcut to intelligence as to the goods, the goods, uh, the quality and um, the nature and quality of the goods and services. In other words. When you go to McDonald's, you know you're going to get a burger and it's going to taste pretty much the same everywhere you go, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's really a consumer protection act, I always say. It's not really, <laughs> but it, it's a consumer protection act in that when there's a trademark associated with, what, all right, I was doing wine before, let's do beer, right? Heineken. You know, Heineken, and it says Heineken on the bottle, but it really is a Coors Light. You're going to tell the difference and you're going to say, what's up? Yeah. So the, it's, it's to protect the consumer. So you really you really can't allow someone else to use a mark without uh, control over the nature and quality of goods. In fact, we call that a naked license. So you can, you can license to other companies to make your goods or services and use your trademark, 
but you have to have a trademark license in place and, and all the rights have to incur to the benefit of you as the owner of that trademark. And you as the owner have to be in control of the nature and quality of the goods or services to allow for that uh, license to be legit. So I'm going to ask one last question before I let you go. And this will introduce hopefully the next time you come on. But I want to talk about this because it's kind of important, which is sure. um, what, one of the most common scenarios you think of is my, my trademark protects my name. The other place where your name matters a lot is in URLs and on website domains. And there's always a fight for the website domains. People are buying those website domains nearly decades in advance. So my question for you is, do I have any trademark rights to a website domain? Can I, as Microsoft, say I own the trademark, therefore I have priority rights or I own the URL? Yeah, that's a perfect question. It's almost like you rewrote that and asked me to talk about it. And this is all ad lib. So congratulations yeah. to you. UDRP is the answer to that, Darshan. And what I mean by that is if you have a registered trademark, you can file what's called a UDRP complaint and ask the ICANN, which oversees URLs, at least top level domains, and take that URL away from that person that is effectively squatting on URL. So if somebody comes up with Microsoft or you probably heard of the, the, the string of trademarks, MicrosoftSucks.com, yeah. mm -hmm. something like that, they can go through this UDRP process and file against it's almost like an in rem they file against the, the url and the owner of it and if they can prove to the udrp masters that are overseeing this the judges that they own the trademark and it's registered and it's valid and it's causing harm that url gets transferred over to the trademark owner but it has to be a registered trademark but now so it speaks to the value and the importance of a trademark because uh, cyber squatting and domain squatting is such a huge issue but yep. is there the equivalent of that, say, on Twitter, on Facebook URLs, on LinkedIn URLs, or is that only in the context of a, I, I don't know what it's called, base domain? I, I forget what the uh, uh, domain Yeah, the UDRP, Uniform Domain Name Dispute Resolution. Um, so to Twitter and every all the other social medias, they all have, well, I shouldn't say they all, most of them have what's called, I call self-help. Um, they used to get involved more than they do now. Then the Safe Harbor Act came out and they said, look, we don't want to deal with this. We're, we're a conduit. We're not trying to infringe by just allowing people to use our cable, so to speak. But if someone brings to our attention a very clear cut, cut and dry, black and white argument, we're going to do something about it. So they allow you to complete a form, believe it or not, like Amazon.com does this and Facebook. If you have a registered trademark and someone's using it, and it's not your your you know authority. You write to Amazon, you write to Facebook or Twitter or what have you, and you say, here it is, here's the registration. We're the owners, they're not, shut them down. And they will, they'll turn them off. But and that's very effective in, in a lot of situations instead of filing cease and desist letters and all this other stuff. You shut them down off at Amazon, and that's their biggest way of making money. It starts the dialogue going. Your question. But but what happens if it, instead of it saying, so the, as you might know, there's a um, anti-smoking drug called Chantix out there. And let's say, um, let's say I own Chantix and uh, I'm protecting it and marketing it and selling it. And someone comes out with Chantix sucks. Do I have the right to prevent them from a trademark perspective or do they have the right to speak from a free speech perspective? Oh, and how do you balance that? Wow. You're jumping into something big. This was, this was my moot court in, in, in law school. Um, but yeah, uh, so so from a UDR st standpoint, you can still get the URL because it's mostly your trademark. From a First Amendment right, it comes down to whether or not it's more of commercial speech versus parody or political speech. So if it's political in that you you know the person touting this is making a political statement that Chanix sucks, you got a battle on your hands because the First Amendment, if it's truly meant to comment comment on it and not to sell anything first amendment's going to win usually interesting so interesting so so what you want what you need to do is you need to be policing these marks you need to be buying up even if you may have a first claim you need to be aggressively buying these marks and working with someone like you to find all of these components i i have to agree with that buy them up so again 
pay me a little now, pay me a lot later. Buy them up now, you know, and, and avoid the arguments, avoid the First Amendment, re, you know, arguments and, and, and all the other litigation, you know, idiosyncrasies you have to get into. You know, no matter what, if even if you're on the winning side, it's going to cost you a lot of money to litigate, right? Yeah. So get them, you know. URLs are nothing, you know, the, get all the dots after, after the dot, get them all or, right. you know, org edge, whatever. Uh, yeah. And all the new ones, um, you know, lock them up and then no one will, will be able to grab them and lock up variations. Like you're saying, um, especially the ones that are derogatory, like, you know, Microsoft sucks or what have you. Um, right. You got to You got to get them all and, and just lock them up and park them. And you know, it's, 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 it's fractions compared to litigation. So what, what you, we've just established today is that trademarks are the Pokemon of the intellectual property world. Got to get them all. Uh, <laughs> Got to get them all. That's right. And, <laughs> and, and they're the whack-a-moles too, right? There's everybody <laughs> the whack -a trying to use your trademark and you got to go after them all the time. For instance, but there's a solution to that. It's called the watch service. So if you have a really important trademark, your house mark, your bet the farm mark, or even some of your secondary ones, Use a watch service, and we provide that as well. Um, we can help people get that going, and it's it's reasonable. And basically, it's an automated system that checks um, applications that are being filed that are, have the same or similar mark for same or similar goods, and it, it's part and parcel to your 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 obligation to police your mark. And is that done at the URL level? Is that done at the trademark application level, or is that done at the commercial level? Mostly, the trademark applications filed at the USPTO level. Okay, got it. Yep. So that's something to uh, consider. Wonderful. We can keep going uh, as is obvious, but we're going to stop here. John, before we go, we have two questions for you. The first question, how can people reach you? Okay. So they can reach me at john.maljian, M-A-L-D-J-I-A-N, at stevenslee.com. That's T-E-V-E-N-S-L-E-E.com. Or they can call my telephone number, which I think you gave out before, and I don't have any. I'm on the screen as we speak. Oh, it's 609-718-0979 if they want to talk more. And I'd be glad to, to talk to anyone, you know, give them, you know, a free initial consultation. Absolutely. And um, what are your parting words? My parting words are, remember, there might be a Rembrandt in the attic. I know we didn't talk about patents that much, but if, if you have a company, take a look at what you think might be your intellectual property. We didn't get to trade secrets and trade uh, know-how, but there's a lot of information that you and others at your company are working on that you believe to be obvious. But if it gives you a competitive advantage over your competitors, it's, it's know-how all the way up to patents, trademarks, copyrights, et cetera. And, you know, have someone like myself or another professional in the intellectual property area do an assessment. And, and talk to you about what you have. You might end up having more in your asset column from your intellectual property than you didn't know about without doing anything other than realizing it's there. And then, of course, we can help you try to officially protect it and all that stuff. But it's already there. And a lot of people are not aware of that. So uh, it's really important that you, you, you check on that. And you have a nice uh, standard operating procedure to make sure your employees are cognizant of that and bringing it to management's attention at all times. Be before I let you go, and I, this was supposed to be the end, but I'm going to ask one last question. You mentioned that. <laughs> this is great. You're, you're actually excited about this. <laughs> I am. I, this, these conversations excite me. That's why I do them. Um, but but you, you mentioned a second ago how you will help them protect the mark. One of the things we all see on TV is that, uh, I don't know which firm it is, but someone who will help you sell and will help you commercialize everything. Is that something you can help with as well? Like, do you have the relationships and, and uh, the, the process to help people go, oh, I found my Rembrandt, now what? Like, Yes. Uh, so I informally have connections, uh, but those, what we call invention companies, I, I just want to caution folks to mm -hmm. really consider when you go to one of them, because they may not tell you what they're exposing. So real short, you know, when it comes to patents, you get, you, you, you have, you can't disclose your idea until you file a patent application. And if you do disclose, you have one year. And one year to file a patent application so in the United States. You get a grace period. Outside the United States, sometimes you don't even get that grace period. But point being is some of those invention companies will take your idea and say they're going to publish it in a magazine and show it to manufacturers, et cetera. Well, they might be blowing your idea at that point. So just be careful. 
Um, I'm not saying not to use them, but you know, just be cognizant of what you're getting for your money. Um, and so to, to your point, um, you asked, what, what can we do to uh, cover that? Um, you know, we, we do have connections to certain manufacturers, to certain investors. Our firm, Stevenson Lee, has multiple platforms where we can help you, you know, get investment money uh, and deal with a lot of different things relating to your company to put it in order so that we can protect your IP, but make it also into a business. And that's what's important. Uh, my job is to identify the intellectual property, file trademarks, patents, copyright applications, and get it allowed so that you have now protectable, recognizable intellectual property that you can then go out and, you know, um, uh, basically solicit or, or, or um, exploit. Um, but we don't, we don't necessarily have, you know, a standard, uh, you know, here's a manufacturer that we use and all that stuff, because it's not really what we do. Absolutely. This was awesome, John. Thank you again. Can't wait to have you back if you'll come on again. I would love to. We need to talk about the other buckets of IP. Absolutely. We haven't even touched them. No, we have not. But this has been great. I hope uh, some folks got something out of it. I hope so, too. I'm, I'm sure someone will reach out. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Darshan. It's great talking.